Water Wars, next on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs at UWM and Milwaukee Public Television present International Focus, a global magazine linking Wisconsin and the world. Welcome to International Focus. I'm Doug Savage, Assistant Director of the Institute of World Affairs at UWM. With the world's fifth largest lake on our doorstep, most people in our community take access to clean water for granted. But for 1.4 billion people across the globe, finding a reliable supply of drinking water is literally a life and death struggle. Control of water supplies is an increasingly contentious issue. At the recent World Water Forum in Istanbul, plans by political and business leaders to address water scarcity were loudly dismissed by activists who charged the forum was simply an attempt to promote corporate water privatization schemes. With us in the studio today, as we attempt to cover the global and local waterfront, is Harvey Bootsma, a research scientist at UWM's Great Lakes Water Institute, whose research focuses on the world's Great Lakes. We're also joined by phone by Winona Hotter, Executive Director of Food and Water Watch, a Washington-based nonprofit consumer organization working to ensure clean water and safe food. She was in Istanbul for the recent World Water Forum. Welcome both of you to International Focus. So glad to be here. Well, Winona, I uh, would like to start with you. If you could uh, give us a little bit of background on the World Water Forum. Well, the World Water Forum is basically a trade show that's put on by the World Water Council and other um, related organizations. And it brings together those advocates of commodifying and privatizing water. And it also has a ministerial associated with it, which is one of the reasons that uh, we have organized counter events, because we think that Really, it's the place of the UN, not uh, a private organization, to put together a ministerial to uh, deal with the private uh, with the problems of providing water for the world's poor. Uh, the last uh, World Water Forum was held in Mexico City, and we also had a uh, a large counter event there. And before that, it was in. Kyoto. They're held every th three years. Uh, and in Kyoto, we brought a large delegation that operated within the forum. And we basically believe the forum is an important uh, event uh, because it uh, purports to create consensus uh, around how these problems are solved. And our message is that there is no consensus that privatization is the way that we're going to solve the problems uh, of the water crisis. So uh, who would be the participants in the sort of official forum? What, what kinds of entities would be represented there? Well, they're usually twenty to 25,000 people, and um, a lot of the private water industry attends, water managers, people who work for government, um, some NGOs. It's a very diverse um, group of uh, players, and one of the reasons that it, we think it's important to bring our message there is many of these people, um, they don't have, they, they aren't ideological. They're, they're not there to promote privatization. It's really the organizers of the forum who are there to promote their vision of, uh, of the future for water. And in the alternative forum, what, what kinds of folks might we expect to see there? Well, the alternative forum has grown very large um, at this uh, event. Um, basically, it's representatives of the social movements around the world who are fighting privatization. We have a very large uh, global water justice movement now. Thousands and thousands of people, of course, they can't all go to Turkey. Uh, also, uh, organizations like my own, uh, nonprofits who are committed to um, positive solutions uh, for uh, providing water for the world's poor, uh, activists from around the world. 
um, and so it, it, there were also two local uh, events, two local forums going on, organized by Turkish activists. One was organized by uh, uh, a group of uh, water engineers and labor, and another one was organized by um, um, social movement activists fighting privatization in Turkey. And all of these events were focused on um, a positive solution for the world's water crisis, which is public management of water and not um, expecting the poor to pay high tariffs um, for the provision of water services. And it was a very hot issue in Turkey because there's been a proposal by the interests who uh, believe in commodifying water to privatize rivers in uh, Turkey. And this has brought a, uh, um, a number, uh, large numbers of people to the forefront to organize against this. So there were lots of things going on that were alternatives to um, the World Water Council's um, water forum, and there were hundreds of people involved. And as reporters who were covering the, uh, uh, the World Water Forum told us, the real action isn't at the, at the, um, at the forum, it's at the alternative events. The only thing interesting going on was there. Well, you've, uh, you've mentioned several times the, the interests that are uh, supporting privatization of water. What, what exactly does that mean in, a, in sort of at this level? Well, at, um, at the, organ the main organizer of the uh, World Water Forum is the World Water Council, which uh, calls itself an international water policy think tank, but it's uh, actually a lot more than that. It's sponsored by uh, the World Bank, and it uses its uh, power and prestige to basically promote private water delivery. Uh, the private water sector and other private corporations dominate its 300-plus membership list. Um, and then there's a sprinkling of government agencies and NGOs. But it's, uh, it's not just the private corporations who are uh, promoting privatization. It's also institutions like the World Bank. And that's because the corporations that want to make a profit on water um, in Europe and in the United States are large shareholders of the World Bank, and so the bank has been used as a way to promote privatization. One of the things that Food and Water Watch did was uh, we released a report uh, for the forum called Dried Up and Sold Out, How the World Bank's Push for Private Water Harms the Poor. And part of what this report did was look at the uh, privatization loans, uh, and we did an analysis of them, uh, and we compared it to an analysis that we did in, in uh, 2004, which looked at the previous four years of uh, World Bank loans, so that would have been 200 to, uh, 203, and 94% required privatization and 93% required uh, what they call cost recovery, which is basically tariffs on uh, high, uh, high rates for uh, the people who receive water services, and in this case, poor people. We did an analysis of the, la analysis of the last four years, and we see that the global water justice movement has had a real effect. Um, now 52% of loans require, as a condition, privatization and 64% cost recovery. And when we look at what World Bank uh, senior officials are saying, they're conflicted. Some are saying, oh, privatization hasn't worked so well, and others are saying full steam ahead on privatization. And surely this forum was focused on privatization. And I'll just um, add one other thing, which is the, the finance and the finance of water infrastructure for the 1.1 billion people who don't have access to potable water is kind of the the central uh, piece of this debate. And at this forum, all of their elaborate plans um, in the past uh, about private corporations financing water for the poor, it's all evaporated. And now the solution that's being promoted is basically uh, tariffs on the poor. So does this 
reflect a, a sort of fundamental change conceptually about water? I mean, historically, it's been considered just sort of a, a basic good, a sort of human right, if you will. Yes, you know, I think what's happened is, um, especially in um, today with the economic crisis, but really for the past uh, 15 years or so, um, water has been viewed as a place to make a profit. And it's because um, we're facing a, a water crisis in the future. It's going to be a, a scarce commodity in, in many locations. And so private capital has stepped in and, and wants to use this crisis as a way to, um, to basically make money. And one of the things that we saw even here in the U.S., is we were leaked some uh, some research documents from a uh, investor research firm called Boning and Scattergood, which um, does research on places that corporations should or that uh, investors should put their money, and it revealed that they see a very favorable future uh, in investing in water infrastructure here in the U.S. Uh, and they outlined a uh, kind of a diabolical strategy for making money, listing the states that have the least regulation, saying that sewage plants are almost unregulated, and so that because companies make their profit on the cost of uh, capital, uh, the bigger the project doesn't have to be an appropriate project, but the bigger the project, the more money they make. And so... Uh, um, one of the things that, that we're trying to do is, is really bust this myth of private sector efficiency, because when you look at the provision of water services, it just does, the facts speak for themselves. It's really not an ideological argument. Uh, private water um, distribution and sanitation just simply costs more. So we've got uh, just about a minute left before our break. What, really, what, what is the alternative model, then, if, if not privatization? Okay, well, for the developing world, it's really a new development model. Right now, the whole focus is uh, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, comes into these developing countries and tells them how to structure their budget. And uh, I'll use Ghana as a, a concrete example, because I've done a lot of work there. Uh, Ghana is a rich country. It's has gold. It's one of the biggest cocoa producers. But the IMF told uh, the government that they can't tax these corporations. Uh, instead, the strategy was a private uh, a loan from the World Bank with high interest rates and then tariffs on the poor. We say, let's use the same strategy that we used here in the United States. Resource-rich countries should be allowed to tax the corporations that are making a profit and then to provide, to figure out how they want to provide water services. We got our water services here in the U.S. almost across the board from a progressive tax system at the turn of the century. There was a decision made that it was to everybody's benefit not to die of cholera, so tax funds were used to build infrastructure. And we have a double standard um, in the developing world. Well, uh, we have to go to our break, but I'd certainly like to thank you for being with us. Winona Hunter, Executive Director of Food and Water Watch. If people want more information, I'm sure you've got a website you could direct them to. Foodandwaterwatch.org. Very good. Thank you very much. And to our viewers, we'll be right back after this short break. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking about water wars with Harvey Bootsma of UWM's Great Lakes Water Institute. Well, Harvey, I'm wondering, anything uh, strike you about Winona's remarks and her, her recounting of the World Water Forum? Um, no, I think privatization is a real issue, and it's one that 
a number of agencies, not, not just environmental groups, but also development agencies are really struggling with. I think um, it's an issue partly because uh, agencies are exploring it because previous models have not worked very well. Um, so even though there's a lot of concerns about where privatization may go, um, there's also concerns about where we've come from and how well previous models have worked, especially. So is it simply just a matter of, of financing the, the development of the infrastructure? Uh, a lot of it has to do with that. Uh, it, it, most previous models, especially in, the, in developing countries, um, water supply facilities and water treatment facilities have been run by government institutions. Um, usually municipal or state uh, institutions. And for the most part, they haven't worked very well. And they haven't worked very well because there haven't been very good um, uh, cost systems in place or charge systems in place for retrieval of funds. And so the systems have fallen apart. Uh, they were originally built uh, often with uh, donor funds. Uh, they coasted along for a little while, but no funds came in to maintain the systems, to keep them working, and so eventually they fell apart. And so that's what folks are looking at now and saying, how can we fix that? And for a lot of people, they're saying, maybe the solution is to move away from government-operated op facilities and move more toward um, privately-operated facilities. Well, let's take a, a step back, if we could, and, and look at the problem. I mean, uh, how, how severe of a water scarcity crisis are we facing? And is it a, a question of just not being enough water or sort of not being enough water where we need it? Right. Uh, I think there's actually two issues that we need to keep in mind. It's not always just water quality. Um, in some places, even in Africa, Asia, there, there's plenty of water. But water quality is often the issue as well. Um, especially when it comes to treatment of wastewater, um, which in turn uh, gets back into the system and affects water supply as well. So both of those are issues, and um, they become bigger issues over time, especially uh, if we consider continents like Africa, where there's been an urbanization over the last 40 to 50 years. Uh, previously, you had relatively small cities and towns that could get by with minimal, minimal water uh, treatment facilities, uh, that's not the case anymore. A lot of these towns have grown into huge cities where you now have a, a very high demand for water and very high impacts on the quality of water. Uh, so now there is a greater need for infrastructure to handle that. Uh, not so much in the rural areas, and that's really, a, um, I think, a different story in rural, rural areas. When we're considering the issues of water supply and water quality, Often there's different approaches that we can take in rural areas as opposed to municipal areas. Well, and, and we, I think in this country, sort of imagine that these issues are, are largely part of the developing world's scenario, unless perhaps if we live in the, the Southwest, but here where we're blessed with abundant water, we think somehow we're, we're perhaps isolated from all of that. But are there sort of reflections of some of these issues locally? Um, well, we certainly have uh, water issues here. First of all, I should say we're blessed with more water than probably anywhere else on Earth. So the Midwest, especially here around Lake Michigan, um, we have more water to work with than uh, most people do anywhere else in the U.S. or the world. Uh, despite that, we do have issues. Um, again, water quantity and water quality issues. Uh, within Milwaukee, water quantity is not so much of an issue. We get our wa water primarily from uh, Lake Michigan, and there's plenty of that to go around from Milwaukee. Uh, but water quality can be an issue at times. Uh, the water we use eventually gets back into our rivers and into Lake Michigan, and we do have concerns about what happens to that, um, whether it's sewage overflows or the contaminants and uh, nutrients that we put into water that ultimately affect the uh, uh, the river systems and the lake systems that they go into. But then, of course, as soon as you get out of the Lake Michigan area, um, you don't have to go very far west of Milwaukee, where people are not relying on Lake Michigan as a water source. They're relying primarily on groundwater, and that is an issue in this area. Uh, much of southeastern Wisconsin groundwater tables have been dropping uh, roughly seven feet per year for the last couple of decades. And so that is running us into uh, water supply concerns in those areas. Well, you know, one of the, the sort of core issues, it seems, with uh, 
some of the things that we heard from the water, or World Water Forum is just who owns the water? Who has the right to, to transport the water, to sell the water? And that certainly has got uh, echoes here uh, locally. Did you talk a little bit about some of the issues around diversion of the Great Lakes water? Um, yeah, that's, that's a, a difficult issue to deal with. Uh, I think we would all agree water is uh, um, a right. Every, every human needs water. Um, just as every human needs air and every human needs food as well. Um, if we look to the one extreme, I don't think we would ever uh, think of commodifying air, at least hopefully we wouldn't uh, move in that direction. On the other extreme, uh, food is a necessity of life and we have commodified food. And water kind of falls in between there somewhere. Um, it doesn't behave quite the same way that uh, air does, but it doesn't behave like food as well. Um, I think what we need to remember with water is when when we get water, often we're only paying for the treatment of that water and the supply of that water to our taps. Uh, that's a service that's being provided that we pay for. But ultimately, we need to take a larger picture than that. Uh, the water that we get uh, comes from an ecosystem, in our case here from Lake Michigan, and we need to look beyond just treatment of that water, but at, at the ecosystem as a whole, and what we do uh, in managing these ecosystems that affects both the quantity and the quality of water. And we're starting to do that. If we look at cities like New York, they've realized now that in the long run, it's more cost effective for them to manage their watershed where they're getting water from, rather than put all of their management and all of their money into a water treatment plant. If you can manage the watershed to ensure that you have a continuous supply of water throughout the year and that the water uh, stays at a high quality, it really reduces your cost of uh, treatment and provision. Well, uh, so in terms of, of the Great Lakes, now, some of our viewers may have heard of the, the Great Lakes Compact. Can you explain a little bit about what that is? Right. Uh, really what the Great, well it's an agreement among the, uh, the eight Great Lakes states on how to handle uh, water and water diversions in the Great Lakes. And the part that's been focused on is how we handle diversions. Right now the rule is that no water within the Great Lakes uh, Basin, so that's any water that when it falls on land, drains into one of the five Great Lakes. None of that may be diverted out of the Great Lakes Basin without the consent of all eight Great Lakes governors. Uh, so a lot of focus has been on that, and that certainly is an issue for um, uh, counties and towns that are slightly outside of the watershed that would like to get that water, places like Waukesha. Um, but really what the Great Lakes Compact is, is. Uh, is an integrated approach to managing water resources in the Great Lakes. It, it's saying we are not going to manage these water resources piecemeal, state by state or municipality by munici municipality, but we're going to look at all that water within the context of the Great Lakes ecosystem, and therefore we will manage it as a community of eight Great, uh, eight great Lakes states as well as the Canadian provinces that are involved. So that's really the, the impetus behind the um, Great Lakes Compact. So, uh, you know, Winona was talking a lot about private sector involvement in the delivery of water and the management of these resources. At this point, within uh, our Great Lakes system, is there any private involvement? Or is it still primarily governmental entities that are managing water? Right. Uh, primarily government. I don't know enough about all the cities in the basin to know what different models are being used. Uh, here within Milwaukee, it's government. Um, but there are um, hybrids as well. For example, you can have uh, a water supply system or a water treatment system that is run more or less privately but um, is overseen by a commission. For example, we have the uh, Metropol Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District here in Milwaukee that's overseen by a commission. So. Uh, we can look at hybrids like that where there, you may try to get the benefits of both privatization while at the same time having oversight from a commission or from some public body to, to which the private group is accountable. Um, and I think that's a model that um, can be considered in other parts of the world. Uh, again, if we go back to Africa, um, we don't necessarily have to consider the two, two extremes of government run or private run, but there may be some hybrids in between there um, that may be effective, at least in the urban areas where water is needed. 
Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't give you the opportunity to uh, talk about plans for uh, the School of Freshwater Science here and what the, the Institute's up to. Right. Um, well, uh, they're still in the works uh, and there's still a lot of work to do, but it's a, an exciting time. Um, really, we've realized um, both within UWM and uh, the broader community here in Milwaukee that uh, Southeast Wisconsin is a great place to work on water. And there's kind of two issues. One is looking at um, issues that we're discussing right now. How do we manage water? How do we manage ecosystems? And that's something that uh, we've been doing for a number of decades at UWM and the Great Lakes Water Institute and uh, something that's needed all over the world. So we're hoping that we can build on the strengths that have been developed over the last several decades. And I'm afraid we're going to uh, have to leave it at that. Sure. Harvey Bootsma, Great Lakes Water Institute, and Winona Howder of Food and Water Watch. Thank you both, and to our viewers, thank you, and we'll see you next time on International Focus. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website.